Welcome back, everybody. We are live in Des Moines, Iowa, and let's get right back to the questions. Brett? Thank you, Megan. Gentlemen, I'll ask you some questions about federal spending and the role of the federal government. Everybody always says they want to cut federal spending, and usually they start by saying they'll cut waste, fraud, and abuse, but that really doesn't ever materialize. We all know that. Governor Christie, you talk a lot about entitlement reform, and you say that that's where the federal government can get savings needed to balance the budget. But can you name even one thing that the federal government does now that it should not do at all? Yeah. You want one? I want one. Yeah. <laughs> How about one that I've done in New Jersey for the last six years, and that's get rid of Planned Parenthood funding for the United States of America. Anything bigger than that? Bigger than that? Let me tell you something. When you see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of children being murdered in the womb, I can't think of anything bigger than that. Thank you, Governor. I realize everyone on, on this stage opposes Obamacare, and you're not alone. Google data shows that in the last month, when people searched policy repeals, that there were a lot of them. Obamacare took the top two spots. But today, there are millions of people who gained health insurance from Obamacare, and they now rely on it. So the question, Senator Cruz, if you repeal Obamacare, as you say you will, mm -hmm. will you be fine if millions of those people don't have health insurance, and what is your specific plan for covering the uninsured? Sure. Well, let's take it one at a time. First of all, we have seen now in six years of Obamacare that it's been a disaster. It is the biggest job killer in this country. Millions of Americans have lost their jobs, have been forced into part-time work, have lost their health insurance, have lost their doctors, have seen their premiums skyrocket. If I am elected president, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. Now, once that is done, everyone agrees we need health care reform. It should follow the principles of expanding competition, empowering patients, and keeping government from getting in between us and our doctors. Three specific reforms that reflect those principles. Number one, we should allow people to purchase health insurance across state lines. That'll create a true 50-state national marketplace, which will drive down the cost of low-cost, catastrophic health insurance. Number two, we should expand health savings accounts so people can save in a tax-advantaged way for more routine health care needs. And number three, we should work to de-link health insurance from employment so if you lose your job, your health insurance goes with you, and it is personal, portable, and affordable. And I'll tell you, Brad, I think that's a much more attractive vision for health care than the Washington-driven, top-down Obamacare that is causing so many millions of people to hurt. Senator Cruz, thank you. Governor Bush, you've advocated for statehood for Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican economy is collapsing under unsustainable debt burden. Uh, only about one million of its four million residents are currently employed. So should American citizens, who you say are already overtaxed, bail out Puerto Rico as well? No, they shouldn't. And uh, I believe that Puerto Rico had a, ought to have the right of self-determination. If I was a Puerto Rican, I'd vote for statehood so that they have full citizenship. They serve in the military. They would have to pay federal taxes. They would, they would accept the responsibilities of, of full U.S. citizenship. But they should have the right of self-determination. Before you get to that, though, Puerto Rico is going to have to deal with the structural problems they face. You know, it's a it's a fact that if you can pay for $79 one-way ticket to Orlando uh, and you can escape the challenges of a declining economy and high crime rates, you move to Orlando. And a lot of people are doing that, and this spiraling out of control requires Puerto Rico to make structural reforms. Federal government can play a role in allowing them to, to do that, but they should not. The process of statehood or the status of Puerto Rico won't be solved until we get to the bigger issue of how you deal with the structural economic problems they're facing right now. Governor Kasich, you're one of two remaining sitting governors uh, still in the race. Your colleague, Governor Rick Snyder in Michigan, is under fire, he and his administration, for the Flint, Michigan water crisis and the botched response to it. How would you have handled that? Well, you've got to be on top of it right away. And, you know, I don't know all the details of what, uh, what uh, Rick Snyder has done. I know there have been people who have been fired, people who are being held accountable. But the fact is, every single engine of government has to move when you see a crisis like that. And I've had many uh, situations in the state of Ohio where we've had to move, whether it's storms, 
whether it was a, a horrible school shooting. There are many crises that come, a water crisis in Toledo. You've got to be on top of it. You've got to go the extra mile. You've got to work with local communities, and you've got to work with the federal government because you realize that people are depending on you. And so you go the extra mile, but people have to be alert. They have to be alert to problems, and when you see a problem, you must act quickly to get on top of it. And people at home are saying they've got a problem. Listen to them, because most of the time, they're absolutely correct. So the fact is, is that we work for the people, the people don't work for us, and we have to have an attitude when we're in government of servanthood. That's what really matters. We serve you, you don't serve us. We listen to you, and, uh, and then we act. Senator Rubio. On the issue of climate change, in 2008, you wanted Florida to get ahead of other states and establish a cap-and-trade system, a program for carbon emissions, which many Republicans thought at the time would hurt the Florida economy. Now you're a skeptic of climate change science, and in fact, you warn that federal efforts to fight climate change will cost U.S. jobs and hurt the U.S. economy. So why the change? Well, Brett, first, that's not entirely the story. At the time, the liberal governor of Florida, who claimed he was a Republican, his name was Charlie Crist, he wanted to impose cap and trade on Florida, and I opposed him. I was the first person out of the box that opposed him on it. And then we saw that the leading candidates for president at the time, both the Republican and the Democrats, all supported it. And what we said is, if they're going to impose this on us, we better prepare to protect the state from it. But I have never supported cap and trade, and I never thought it was a good idea. And I was clear about that at the time. And I do not believe it's a good idea now. I do not believe that we have to destroy our economy in order to protect our environment. And especially with these programs are asking us to pass, that will do nothing to help the environment, but will be devastating for our economy. When I am president of the United States of America, there will never be any cap and trade in the United States. Thank you, Senator. All right, we're going to move on because coming up, immigration and something you've never seen before. Stay tuned right after this break.
in Des Moines, Iowa, and now we move on to the topic of immigration. Senator Rubio, we start with you. When you ran for Senate in 2010, you made clear that you opposed legalization and citizenship for illegal immigrants. You promised repeatedly that you would oppose it as a U.S. Senator as well. Here are just a few examples. Watch. Never support, never have, and never will support any effort to grant blanket legalization amnesty to folks who have entered the, or stayed in this country illegally. First of all, earned path to citizenship is basically code for amnesty, is what they call it. And the reality of it is this. It is unfair to the people that have legally entered this country to create an alternative pathway for individuals who entered illegally and knowingly did so. You cannot grant amnesty. If the American people see us grant amnesty, they will never again believe in legal immigration. They will never again support it. And that's wrong for our country, bad for our future. Within two years of getting elected, you were co-sponsoring legislation to create a path to citizenship. In your words, amnesty. Haven't you already proven that you well, cannot be trusted on this issue? No, because if you look at the quote, and it's very specific, and it says blanket amnesty. I do not support blanket but you went amnesty. On I do that. not support amnesty. You said more than that, sir. No, I said I do not support blanket you legalization. You said earned path to citizenship is basically code for amnesty. You it supported was. earned path to citizenship. It absolutely has been. And at the time in the context of that was in 2009 and 2010, where the last effort for legalization was an effort done in the Senate. It was an effort led by several people that provided almost an instant path with very little obstacles moving forward. What I've always said is this issue does need to be solved. They've been talking about this issue for 30 years, and nothing ever happens. And I'm going to tell you exactly how we're going to deal with it when I am president. Number one, we're going to keep ISIS out of America. If we don't know who you are or why you're coming, you will not get into the United States. Number two, we are going to enforce our immigration laws. I am the son and the grandson of immigrants, and I know that securing our borders is not anti-immigrant, and we will do it. We will hire 20,000 new border agents instead of 20,000 new IRS agents. We will finish the 700 miles of fencing and walls our nation needs. We'll have mandatory E-Verify a mandatory entry-exit tracking system. And until all of that is in place and all of that is working and we can prove to the people of this country that illegal immigration is under control, nothing else is going to happen. We are not going to round up and deport 12 million people, but we're not going to go around handing out citizenship cards either. There will be a process. We will see what the American people are willing to support, but it will not be unconstitutional executive orders like the ones Barack Obama has forced on. Governor Bush, do you agree that Senator Rubio has not reversed himself on, on his immigration promise? Well, I'm, I'm kind of confused because he was the sponsor of the Gang of Eight bill that did did require uh, a, a bunch of thresholds, but it ultimately allowed for citizenship over an extended period of time. I mean, that's that's a fact. And um, he asked me to support that. And I, I supported him because I think people, when you're elected, you need to do things. And he led the charge to finally fix this immigration problem that has existed now for, as, as Marco says, for 30 years. And then he cut and run because it wasn't popular amongst, uh, amongst conservatives, I guess. Here's what I believe. And I wrote a book about this called Immigration Wars. You can get it at two ninety nine on Amazon. It's not a bestseller, I can promise you. There won't be any. You can get it. It's, it's affordable for everybody. We should have a path to legal status for the 12 million people that are here illegally. It means come out from the shadows, pay a fine earn legal status by working, by paying taxes, learning English, not committing crimes, and, and, and earn legal status when you're not cutting in front of the line for people that uh, are patiently waiting outside. That is the, I think that's the conservative consensus, pragmatic approach to how to solve this problem. Go ahead, Senator. It's interesting that Jeb mentions the book. That is the book where you changed your position on immigration. Because you used to support a path to citizenship. So did you. Well, but you changed the yeah. in the book. So did you, Marco. You wrote a book where you changed their position from no. The, you you wrote a book where you changed their position from a path to citizenship to a path to legalization. And the bottom line is this: we are not going to be able to do anything on this issue until we first bring illegal immigration under control. The American people have been told for 30 years they're going to enforce the border, they're going to build the wall, and it never gets built, and it never happens. It is very clear there will be no progress on this issue in any way, shape, or form until you prove to the people of this country that illegal immigration is under control, and when I'm president, we are going to bring it under control once and for all after 30 years of talking about it. Marco, Marco, he brought up my name. I have supported a consensus approach to solving this problem wherever it came up. And then 2007, it almost passed when my, when my brother was president of the United States. A bipartisan approach got close. Barack Obama actually had the poison pill to, to stop it then. And when you led the charge with the Gang of Eight, I supported it because you asked me to. I think it's important for people in elected office to try to forge consensus to solve problems. There's never going to be a perfect bill. All right. But, 
But when you didn't do that and you asked people to support, you shouldn't cut and run. But Megan, you should won't. stick with it. And that's won't. exactly what happened. He cut and run. And that's a, that's a tragedy but because Megan, now it's harder and harder to actually ahead, solve this, will be this the last problem. One. There's not going to be any consensus on this issue until we enforce our immigration law. Hey, that I'm is abundantly that, clear. No, you that. are not going to be able to ram down the throat of the American people your approach. The only way we're going to be able to move forward after two migratory crises with minors, after two unconstitutional executive orders, the only way forward on this issue is to first bring illegal immigration under control. And until that happens, there's not going to be any consensus okay. on this issue. Let's move on. Senator Cruz. When Senator Rubio proposed that bill creating a path to citizenship, you proposed an amendment. Mm -hmm. It would have allowed for legalization, but not citizenship. Yes, it would. Press last month on why you supported legalization, you claimed that you didn't, right, like you just did. I saw that. You argued that this was just a poison pill amendment, basically something designed to kill the bill and not actually get it through. But that is not, however, how it sounded at the time. Watch. I want this bill to be voted down. I don't want immigration reform to fail. I want immigration reform to pass. I believe if this amendment were to pass, the chances of this bill passing into law would increase dramatically. I believe if the amendments I introduced were adopted that the bill would pass. And, and my effort in introducing them was to find a solution that reflected common ground and that fixed the problem. If the proponents of this bill actually demonstrate a commitment not to politics, not to campaigning all the time, but to actually fixing this problem, to finding a middle ground that would fix the problem and also allow for those 11 million people who are here illegally a legal status with citizenship off the table. Was that all an act? It was pretty convincing. You know, the amendment you're talking about is one sentence. It's 38 words. Anyone can go online at tedcruz.org and read exactly what it said. In those 38 words, it said anyone here illegally is permanently ineligible for citizenship. It didn't say a word about legalization. But the bill I allowed both. The bill you were amending allowed citizenship but, but, and legalization. But, Megan, the bill was a thousand pages. I introduced a series of amendments, each designed to fix problems in the bill. The fact that each amendment didn't fix every problem didn't mean that I supported the rest of the bill. And I'll tell you who supported my amendment. Jeff Sessions, the strongest opponent of amnesty in the United States Congress, and he did so because taking citizenship off the table was important and it revealed the hypocrisy of the, the proponents of this bill who were looking for votes. Listen, we can solve immigration. We just heard an argument back and forth that we can't solve immigration. I have a detailed immigration plan that is on my website, tedcruz.org. It was designed with Iowa's own Congressman Steve King and Jeff Sessions. And we have the tools in federal law to do this now. We can build the fence. We can triple the border patrol. We can end sanctuary cities by cutting off funding to them. We can end welfare for those here illegally. And what is missing is the political will, because too many Democrats and sadly too many Republicans don't want to solve this problem. If I am elected president, we will secure the borders okay, sir. and we will end illegal immigration. Senator Paul, you know how Washington works. Do you buy that? I was there and I saw the debate. I saw Ted Cruz say, we'll take citizenship off the table and then the bill will pass and I'm for the bill. The bill would involve legalization. He can't have it both ways. But what is particularly insulting though is that he is the king of saying, oh, you're for amnesty. Everybody's for amnesty except for Ted Cruz. But it's a falseness, and that's an authenticity problem, that everybody he knows is not as perfect as him because we're all for amnesty. I was for legalization. I think, frankly, if you have border security, you can have legalization. So was Ted, but now he says it wasn't so. That's not true. Go ahead, sir. You know, John Adams famously said, facts are stubborn things. The facts are very, very simple. When that battle was waged... My friend Senator Rubio chose to stand with Barack Obama and Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer and support amnesty. And I stood alongside Jeff Sessions and Steve King. We led the fight against amnesty. 
And if you want to know who's telling the truth, you should look and ask people like Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions and Steve King and Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin, all of whom say, as Jeff Sessions said, responding to these false attacks just recently in Alabama, he said, if it wasn't for Ted Cruz, the Gang of Eight Rubio Schumer bill would have passed, but because Ted stood up and helped lead the effort, millions rose up to kill him. Chuck Schumer, your co-sponsor of yeah, that bill, agrees respond. with Ted Cruz on this. I understand, but let me respond. I was mentioned on this in this answer, and so I'm going to respond on this way. This is the lie that Ted's campaign is built on, and Rand touched upon it, that he's the most conservative guy and everyone else is a, you know, everyone else is a rhino. The truth is, Ted, throughout this campaign, you've been willing to say or do anything in order to get votes. Ted, you work for George W. Bush's campaign. <laughs> You, vote, you, work, you helped design George W. Bush's. You helped design George W. Bush's immigration policy. And then when you got to the Senate, you did an interview with CBS News that wasn't even part of the video, where you said on the issue of people that are here illegally, we can reach a compromise. And then in the committee, you said, I want to bring people out of the shadows. Now you want to trump Trump on immigration. But you can't. We're not going to beat Hillary Clinton with someone who's willing to say or do anything to win an election. Go ahead, Senator Cruz. You know, I like Marco. He's very charming. He's very smooth. But the facts are simple. <laughs> when he ran for election in the state of Florida, he told the people of Florida, if you elect me, I will lead the fight against amnesty. When I ran in Texas, I told the people of Texas, if you elect me, I will lead the fight against amnesty. We both made the identical promises. But when we came to Washington, we made a different choice. Marco made the choice to go the direction of the major donors to support amnesty because he thought it was politically advantageous. I honored my commitments, and as president, I will honor every commitment that I make to the men and women of this country. Go ahead, Governor Christie. I, I want to ask the, the people in the audience. Like, I'm standing here. I, I watched the video of Senator Cruz. I watched this, the video of Senator Rubio. I heard what they said. And this is why you need to send someone from outside of Washington to Washington. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I need, I feel like I need a Washington to English dictionary converter, right? <laughs> I mean, I heard what they both said. I saw it on the video. And the fact is, this is what makes a difference when you're a governor. You can change your mind. Ted could change his mind. Marco could change his mind. It's perfectly legal in this country to change your mind. But when you're a governor, you have to admit it. You can't hide behind parliamentary tricks. That's the difference, and that's the kind of leader we need in the White House. Stop the Washington bull, and let's get things done. All right. Let's get to a YouTube question. Let's get to a YouTube question. This is a question from a YouTube creator with over 2 million subscribers. Watch. I'm Dulce Candy, a YouTube creator who immigrated to the United States from Mexico when I was a little girl. Since then, I am proud to say that I served in the armed forces in Iraq, became a citizen, and I am now an entrepreneur. There are many immigrants who contribute positively to the American economy. But some of the comments in the campaign make us question our place in this country. If America does not seem like a welcoming place for immigrant entrepreneurs, will the American economy suffer? Dr. Carson, that's one, that one's for you. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as I said before, uh, we are a land of immigrants, but we have to be intelligent about the way that we uh, form our immigration policies. And that's one of the reasons that I have called on us to declare war on the Islamic State because we need to reorient our immigration policies and our visa policies for people who are coming into this country because there are many people out there who want to destroy us. Now, I recognize that uh, uh, the vast majority of people coming in here probably are not those kinds of people, but that's not good enough. If you've got 10 people coming to your house and you know one of them is a terrorist, you're probably going to keep them all out. You know, we probably have to figure out a way to make sure that we keep America safe. Can I, can I, can I, I just, Go ahead, that, that beautiful young woman who's an entrepreneur who served in the military, first of all, is deserving of our respect for service in the military and the fact that she's an entrepreneur. And we should be a welcoming nation. 
our, our identity is not based on race or ethnicity. It's based on a set of shared values. That's American citizenship. And Dulce Candy, pretty cool name, actually, uh, <laughs> that is now an entrepreneur over the YouTube, is part of that American experience. And we should celebrate it as conservatives. That's what we believe in. You can, you can deal with the threat of terror and also recognize that this country should be aspirational across the board. Yeah, and I think Thank that's you. the false point. That's the, that's the false choice in this whole debate about immigration. Of course we're going to be a nation of immigrants. By the way, no nation on earth is more generous than America is. Every single year, close to a million people immigrate to the United States legally. There's no nation on earth that comes close to that number. I think the only argument is, are we a sovereign country? Are we not allowed to choose who comes in, when they come in, and how they come in? And that's not what's happening now. I think the other problem is, we have a legal immigration system that's outdated. It is primarily based on whether you have family members living here. In the 21st century, it has to be more of a merit-based system. And that is why our legal immigration system is in need of modernization. And we will always celebrate legal immigration like Dulce's great All right, we're moving on. Gentlemen, we're going to turn now to what we call electability issues that you're either facing in the primaries or issues that you're certainly going to face in a general election. So you may not be altogether unhappy if you're not included in this round. <laughs> Senator Cruz, you pride yourself on standing up to the D.C. cartel, but as we've seen to a certain degree tonight, there's a price for standing up to the D.C. cartel. Thirteen Republican senators have endorsed other candidates. None have endorsed you. You, twice last year, you asked for a colleague to second a motion, a routine courtesy, on the Senate floor, and no senator would do it. Top GOP officials worry that if you're at the top of the ticket, some officials, that not only will you lose the White House, but it will tank the ticket all the way down the line. Question is, does your style sometimes get in the way of your ability to get things done, sir? Well, Chris, you, you are exactly right that, that, that I am not the candidate uh, of career politicians in Washington. And I'll tell you, the endorsements that I am proud of are the over 200,000 volunteers across this country who have signed up to volunteer for our campaign. The endorsements that I am proud of are leading conservatives like Iowa's own Congressman Steve King, who is a national co-chairman of my campaign. The endorsements that I'm proud of are conservative leaders like Dr. James Dobson and over 700,000 contributions nationwide, people going to our website, tedcruz.org. This is a grassroots campaign. And, you know, when I ran for Senate in Texas, I told the people of Texas that I'm not going there to go along to get along. Washington is broken. And the people I have been accountable to every single day in the Senate are the 27 million Texans who I represent, and I made a promise to them that I make to you today, which is if I am elected, every single day I will do two things, tell the truth and do what I said I would do. Thank you, sir. Governor Bush, poll after poll shows you running among the worst in your party against Hillary Clinton. Even Mitt Romney said that a Bush v. Clinton head-to-head -head would be too easy for the Democrats. Yet still, you and the super PAC supporting you continue to blanket the airwaves with cutting ads, not against Mrs. Clinton, but against your fellow Republicans, especially Senator Rubio. Do these attacks do more harm than good by targeting those candidates who appear to have the best chance of defeating Mrs. Well, Clinton? First of all, I've seen polls where I'm beating Hillary Clinton pretty regularly, and I believe I can because I have a proven record, a record of accomplishment, a record of cutting taxes, of shrinking the government, of reforming education, of challenging the status quo, eliminating career civil service protections, shrinking the government workforce by 11 percent, but leading the nation in job growth. That's the record of accomplishment that should be taken to Hillary Clinton, who has no record of accomplishment. So I'm confident if I win this nomination, I will aggressively uh, go against her and beat her. As it relates to the super PACs, I have no control over that. And this is beanbag compared to what the Clinton hit machine is going to do to the Republican nominee. The simple fact is we all have a record. It all be scrutinized. There's give and take. It's called politics. And that's the way it is. I'm running hard, and I believe I'll be the Republican nominee, and I'll be the one best suited to beat Hillary Clinton, who should not be president of the United States. Senator Rubio, first, before I ask you the question, any response to Governor Bush? 
Well, I believe and I know that if Iowa helps make me the Republican nominee, I will defeat Hillary Clinton. Hillary doesn't want to run against me, but I cannot wait to run against her. And I cannot wait to earn the opportunity to do it because she cannot be the president of the United States. She wants to put Barack Obama on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. She said that here in Iowa just two days ago. That would be a disaster for this country. So I hope and pray and cannot wait until this state and others give me an opportunity to serve this party as its nominee because I will defeat Hillary Clinton. Now, let's talk about electability, Senator. Time magazine once called you the Republican savior. Rush Limbaugh and others said you likely will be president someday. But if you look at the recent average of polls in your home state of Florida, you're in third, trailing Donald Trump by 24 points. If the people who know you best have you there, why should the rest of the country elect you? Well, let me be clear about one thing. There's only one savior, and it's not me. It's Jesus Christ who came down to earth and died for our sins. And so, and I've always made that clear about that, that cover story. As far as the polls are concerned, Iowa, on Monday night, you're going to go to a caucus site, and you'll be the first Americans that vote in this election. You will be the first Americans that get to answer the fundamental question, what comes next for this country after seven disastrous years of Barack Obama? And let me tell you what the answer better not be. It better not be Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is a socialist. I think Bernie Sanders is a good candidate for president of Sweden. We don't want to be Sweden. We want to be the United States of America. And Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton is disqualified from being the commander in chief of the United States. In fact, one of her first acts as president may very well be to pardon herself. Because Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton stored classified information on her private server. And Hillary Clinton lied to the families of those four brave Americans who lost their life in Benghazi. And anyone who lies to the families of Americans who have died in the service of this country can never be Commander-in-Chief of the United States. Thank you, Senator. Governor Christie, two of your former top aides go on trial in May for fraud and conspiracy in the Bridge case, the politically motivated closure of lanes to the George Washington Bridge. Another former aide who has already pleaded guilty and will likely testify for the government, as you know, says that you knew about this whole deal. Can the GOP take the chance of nominating you with this scandal still out there, sir? Sure, because there's been three different investigations and proven that uh, I knew nothing. Um, and the fact is that what I did do, what I did do from the beginning, Chris, as soon as I found out about it, I fired the people who were responsible. And that's what you expect from a leader. And I'll tell you something else. I inherited a state in New Jersey that was downtrodden and beaten by liberal democratic policies, high taxation, high regulation. And this year in 2015, New Jersey has had the best year of job growth that our state has ever had in the last 15 years. That's because we put conservative policies in place. And I'll tell you one other thing. I, you know why the Republican Party will want to take a chance on me? Because they know that Hillary Clinton will never be prosecuted by this Justice Department, and they're going to want to put a former federal prosecutor on the stage to prosecute her next September. And there is no one on this stage better prepared to prosecute the case against Hillary Clinton than I am. I will be ready. I will take her on. And when I take her on, I guarantee you one thing. She will never get within 10 miles of the White House. The days for the Clintons in public housing are over. <laughs> Much more to come, including where the candidates stand on foreign policy. And once again, you can go to Google.com or open your Google search app and search Fox News debate to vote on which candidate you think is winning the debate tonight. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody. Let's get back to the questions. Chris? Gentlemen, almost 60 percent of Repo Republican caucus goers identify themselves as evangelicals, so I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring social issues. Governor Kasich, you talk a good deal about your faith. In fact, you say it played a role in your decision to expand Medicaid, and you say that when you meet St. Peter at the pearly gates, he's going to ask what you did for the poor, not what you did to keep government small. Senator Cruz is on the opposite side of this issue from you, so does that mean that you're getting in and he isn't? <laughs> no, you know, uh, Chris, here, here's what, what happened with Medicaid in my state. We took the growth of Medicaid from over 10 percent in my second budget to 2.5 percent without cutting off one person or cutting one benefit because we, uh, we innovated the government. And now mom and dad can stay in their own home rather than being forced into a nursing home. And then we decided we could bring $14 billion of our money. I mean, Washington doesn't have any money. It was our money. We brought them back to tend to the mentally ill because I don't think they ought to live in prison or live under a bridge to treat the drug addicted so they're not in a in and out of door policy out of the prisons and to help the working poor so they don't live in emergency rooms. How's it worked? Well, we have treated the drug addicted in our prisons and we released them into the community and our recidivism rate is less than 20 percent. That's basically bordering on a miracle because of our great prison director. The mentally ill, they've been stepped on for too long in this society and uh, we are beginning to treat them. In terms of my faith, look, all I say is that when I study scripture, I know that people who live in the shadows need to have a chance. But I'm not deciding that anybody's got to make these decisions the way that I do on the basis of what I do, but what I will tell you this, the time has come to stop ignoring the mentally ill in this country and begin to treat them and get them on their feet, along, of course, with treating the drug addicted. Because we don't want them in and out. We don't want them in and out of the prisons. Give people a chance. We talked about criminal justice reform. We've enacted it in our state. Look, the conservative message is economic growth. And along with economic growth goes opportunity for everybody in America. Everybody ought to have a chance to be able to rise to their God-given purpose. And that is what we have done in Ohio. We're running surpluses. We're up 400,000 jobs. And guess what? The formula is working. I'd suggest people take a look at it. Thank you. Gentlemen, we had a case study on religious liberty just this last summer. A county clerk in Kentucky named Kim Davis refused to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples after the Supreme Court ruling, saying that it violated her religious beliefs. Governor Christie, you said that she must follow the law or be moved to another job that would be in keeping with her conscience. But some conservatives say that that violates her religious liberty. Now, what I said, Chris, was that the law needs to be followed and that someone in that office has to do their job. So if Ms. Davis wanted to step aside and get rid of her ability to be able to do that, there should be someone else in that office who it didn't violate their conscience so they could follow the law of the state of Kentucky. I never said that Ms. Davis should either lose her job or that she had to do it. But what I did say was that the person who came in for the license needed to get it. And so if there's someone in that, in that organization, and it turns out there was, who was willing to be able to do that, that's what we should do. But just as importantly, and I and agree with what John said, you know, we all have our own individual interpretations of our faith. And here's the problem with what's going on around the world. The radical Islamic jihadists, what they want to do is impose their faith upon each and every one of us every one of us. And the reason why this war against them is so important is that very basis of religious liberty. They want everyone in this country to follow their religious beliefs the way they do. They do not want us to exercise religious liberty. That's why as commander in chief, I will take on ISIS, not only because it keeps us safe, but because it allows us to absolutely conduct our religious affairs the way we find in our heart and in our souls. As a Catholic, that's what I want to do. And no matter what your faith is, that's what I want you to be able to do. Thank you, sir. Senator Rubio, during the last debate, you said Governor Christie had changed his position and his mind on gun control, on Common Core, and backing President Obama's nomination of Soda Sotomayor to the Supreme Court. He said you're wrong on the facts and you can't, quote, slime your way to the White House. I assume in the last two weeks you've done some fact-checking. Do you want to take anything back? Yeah, I would encourage people to go on my website, MarcoRubio.com, and we'll put all the facts up there so people can see it for themselves. But you've just asked a very fundamental question about the role of faith in our country, and I think this is an important question. I think if you do not understand that our Judeo-Christian values are one of the reasons why America is such a special country, you don't understand our history. 
You see, why are we one of the most generous people in the world? No, the most generous people in the world. Why do Americans contribute millions of dollars to charity? It is not because of the tax write-off. It is because in this nation, we are influenced by Judeo-Christian values that teach us to care for the less fortunate, to reach out to the needy, to love our neighbor. This is what's made our nation so special. And you should hope that our next president is someone that is influenced by their faith. Because if your faith causes you to care for the less fortunate, it is something you want to see in your public figures. And when I'm president, I can tell you this, my faith will not just influence the way I'll govern as president, it will influence the way I live my life. Because in the end, my goal is not simply to live on this earth for 80 years, but to live an eternity with my creator. And I will always allow my faith to influence everything I do. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Senator Paul, in May, in May on the campaign trail, you said you didn't get into politics to fight about abortion. You said you were more concerned about the national debt. Your answer is to turn abortion back to the states the way it was before Roe v. Wade. Does that mean that if a liberal state, let's say, wants to make abortion legal, that you're okay with that? And what do you say to conservative voters who believe deeply that abortion is murder? You know, I think abortion is always wrong. I've supported a variety of uh, solutions, both state as well as federal. In fact, just last week, I introduced the Life at Conception Act, which would say that, would say that the 14th Amendment would defend uh, an individual, even in the womb. But I think on the broader question of religion and politics, you know, I think liberty itself requires a virtue, requires a virtuous people. In fact, Washington said that democracy requires a virtuous people. Oz Guinness, the theologian, said that liberty requires restraint, but the only restraint consistent with liberty is self-restraint. There's a lot packed into that statement. But the bottom line is we must have virtue, we must have a religious bearing as a nation, but government's not always going to save us, and it's not always going to come from government. But if we don't know right and wrong, I think we have lost our way, I think we come unmoored, and I think without the religious foundation that guides us all, I think we have a great risk of going horribly in the wrong direction. Sir, just 30 seconds to answer my specific... Just 30 seconds to answer my specific question. Do you favor the idea that abortion b should be a state's rights issue, and if a liberal state wants to make it legal, that that's their choice? Yes uh, or no? Uh, no, both. Both a federal and a state approach. I have said that we could leave it to the states, but I've also introduced a federal solution as well. So the federal solution would be the Life at Conception Act, which is an act that would federalize the issue. But I've also said, for the most part, these issues would be left back to the states. So there might be an occasion if we did overturn Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade nationalized the issue. If you actually had the court reverse Roe v. Wade, it would become a state issue once again. I think it would be better the more abor the less abortions we have. So the more states that we had that made abortion uh, illegal, the better as far as trying to save and preserve lives. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, I'd like to ask a few questions about foreign policy broadly. Dr. Carson, many experts believe Russian leader Vladimir Putin has greater ideas, bigger designs for the region beyond Russia's actions inside Ukraine. Fast forward to February 2017, and it is President Carson and Russian ununiformed commandos the Estonian border, and they occupy a city in Estonia. Estonia, a member of NATO, uh, essentially invokes Article 5. An attack on one is an attack on all. What do you do? Well, first of all, I recognize that Vladimir Putin is an opportunist, and he's a bully, and we have to face him down. And I would, first of all, uh, face him down in that whole region, the whole Baltic region. I think we need to put in some armored brigades there. We only have one or two. We need much more than that. We need to be doing military exercises uh, in not only Estonia, but Latvia and Lithuania. Those, they're terrified by the saber rambling. Uh, I think we ought to put in our missile defense system. I think we ought to give Ukraine offensive weapons. And I think we ought to fight them on the economic basis, because Putin is a one-horse uh, country, oil and energy. And we ought to fight them on that level. We ought to be helping uh, in terms of the technology for fracking, keeping the price low, quite frankly, because that's what's keeping him contained. So, uh, yes, I absolutely would go in if he uh, attacked, I think, on Article 5 of NATO, we would definitely protect all of our allies.
Gentlemen, you've all said that the Iran nuclear deal is a bad one. Senator Rubio, you're among the candidates who've said that you would tear it up on day one. But as you know, Iran has already received tens of millions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars in this deal, and has quickly reestablished ties economically with Europe. The major concessions, in other words, are up front in this deal. So should you win, by the time you take office, the remaining parts of the deal would be the constraints on Iran. So why blow up those constraints on day one, letting Iran off the hook? Well, let me first describe Iran, because they're not just a normal nation state, and we have no quarrel with the Iranian people. But the Iranian leader, their supreme leader, is a radical Shia cleric who has an apocalyptic vision of the future. He views himself not simply as the leader of Iran, but as the leader of all Muslims, all Shia Muslims on the planet. And they have a desire not simply to conquer the Middle East and to become the dominant power in that region, but ultimately to be able to hold America hostage. That is why they're building in right now and developing long-range missiles capable of reaching the United States. And that is why there's going, they're going to use those $100 billion to expand their conventional capabilities and to one day buy or build a nuclear weapon. We will re when I am president of the United States, on my first day in office, we are canceling the deal with Iran, and nations will have to make a choice. They can do business with Iran, or they can do business with America, and I am very confident they're going to choose America before they choose the Iranian economy. Governor Kasich, you've said that Marco Rubio is wrong, that Senator Rubio is wrong with tearing it up on day one. Look, we don't know what's going to happen in 10 months. And if I were president of the United States right now, I'd be lining up our allies to say that if one cross T or one dotted I does not occur, they violate the agreement, we slap back on sanctions. We can slap on sanctions alone on day one, but it's not going to be anywhere near as effective. But the president needs to be laying the groundwork right now for the ability to slap those sanctions back on worldwide. And I'll tell you what I'm worried about. I'm worried about money. You read about all the companies now that are doing business, about to do business in Iran. And if we don't get this settled now with other countries in the world about sanctions, then Iran could violate that agreement, and we're the only ones putting the sanctions on. We need to move aggressively now. But I would say this to you, Brett. Number one, if they violate it, we need to move against them. And number two, if we find out they're developing a nuclear weapon and we know how to get to it, we're going to go take it out. That is what we have to do. We cannot let things get farther down the road like we did with North Korea. But, Governor Kasich, you know that the most powerful sanctions are the multilateral ones. That's right. That's... And these European countries are already reestablishing these ties. I know, Brad. They don't want... But, Brad, here's the problem. You take a look at, the, at Belgium. I talked to a diplomat from Belgium. I said, how's it going? He said, we have the military in the streets right now. We never dreamt we'd ever see it. See, I think there is an opportunity to bring the world together. The Turks are being threatened. We know about the French. We know about the Belgians. We know about the Brits. Everybody is under fire and under attack, and we have to stand together as an alliance. So actually, the opportunity is there because of the threat to all of these countries to bring all of us together and say there is something more important than money. It is the future in the world and the future of our children and grandchildren. That's the kind of leadership this country needs, and it has not been in effect during the administration of Barack Obama. And that's only the beginning of the failures that they have committed, not only in the Middle East, but all over the world, including Russia and China. Governor, thank you. Governor Christie, Libya is the newest base for ISIS. Just today, Defense Secretary Ashton Carter said ISIS is consolidating their footprint there and also setting up training facilities. So if you were president, would you deploy U.S. troops to Libya to take out ISIS there? Brett, let me tell you. This is another one of those places where Hillary Clinton has so much to answer for and why she is completely unqualified to be commander in chief. In a previous Democratic debate, Martha Raddatz three times asked Hillary Clinton about the failure in Libya, a policy that she took credit for, and said, what is your measure of responsibility, Madam Secretary, for the failure in Libya? Three times she refused to answer the question because she refuses to be held accountable for anything that goes wrong. If it had gone right, believe me, she would have been running around to be able to take credit for it. Here's what I'd do. This is about the bigger, broader war against ISIS. We need to bring together our European and our Sunni Arab allies, and we need to develop a strategy together to take on ISIS every place that it is around the world so that together all of us can take ISIS out, destroy it, and then move on to come back to our country, protect our homeland security, and make sure that the American people are safe. As President of the United States, that is exactly what I will do. Thank you, Governor.
We're not finished yet. More to come from the presidential debate live from Des Moines, Iowa next. And remember, to see how the campaigns are responding to the debate in real time, go to Google.com or open your Google search app and search Fox News debate. And please stay with us. Welcome back to Des Moines. Let's resume the debate. Megan. Senator Paul, you have suggested that former President Bill Clinton's history with women is fair game in this campaign. How do you answer those who say you don't hold the sins of the husband against the wife? You know, I've never really brought this up unless asked the question, but I have responded to the question. I don't blame Hillary Clinton at all for this. I don't think she's responsible for his behavior. But I do think that her position as promoting women's rights and fairness to women in the workplace, that if what Bill Clinton did, any CEO in our country did with an intern, with a 22-year-old, 21-year-old intern in their office, they would be fired. They would never be hired again. Fired, never hired again, and probably shunned in their community. And the thing is, she can't be a champion of women's rights at the same time she's got this that is always lurking out there, this type of behavior. So it is difficult. Of her husband's. Yeah, but I combine this also with the millions upon millions of dollars they've taken from regimes in the Middle East who treat women like, like cattle. We have another question from one of YouTube's top creators. Here it is.
I'm Nabel Anur. I'm a Muslim American born and raised in the U.S. who creates beauty and lifestyle videos on YouTube. In 2015, the number of hate crimes against Muslims in the U.S. has tripled. And on social media, where I spend a lot of time, I've seen many attacks directed towards fellow Muslims. This culture of hatred is only driving ISIS to radicalize, recruit, and incite violence. As president, what would you do to address this toxic climate and promote increased tolerance in the United States? Governor Bush, how do you answer Nabila? Well, first of all, I think it's important that when we're running for the highest office in the land, that we recognize that we're living in dangerous times and we have to be serious about it, that our words have consequences. Donald Trump, for example, I'm glad he, I mentioned his name again, just anybody was missing him. Um, <laughs> Mr. Trump believed that in reaction to people's fears that we should ban all Muslims. Well, that creates a, an environment that's toxic in our own country. Nabella is a rising entrepreneur. She wants to pursue the American dream. She's an American citizen. She should not feel uncomfortable about her citizenship. She's not the threat. The threat is Islamic terrorism. We need to focus our energies there, not these broad blanket kind of, of uh, statements that will make it harder for us to deal with, with ISIS. We, we need to deal with ISIS in the caliphate. We need a strategy to destroy ISIS there. You can't do that without the cooperation of the Muslim world, because they're as threatened as we are. And so I think it's important for us to be careful about the language we use, school of Donald Trump, disparaging women disparaging Hispanics. That's not a sign of strength. Making fun of disabled people, we're never going to win elections if we don't have a more broader unifying message. Governor, thank you. Senator Cruz, change of subjects. You've called for an end to the renewable fuel standards, which mandate that refineries blend biofuels, including ethanol, into gasoline. As you well know, ethanol is a big industry in this state, $10 billion a year. Last week, Terry Branstad, the popular governor of Iowa, who is in the hall tonight, said that you're, said that you're bankrolled by big oil and that Iowa voters would be making a mistake supporting you. Why should those voters side with you over the six-term governor of this state, sir? Well, Chris, I'm glad to discuss my views on ethanol and energy. I, I think God has blessed this country with enormous natural resources, and we should pursue all of the above. We should be developing oil and gas and coal and nuclear and wind and solar and ethanol and biofuels. But I don't believe that Washington should be picking winners and losers, and I think there should be no mandates and no subsidies whatsoever. And indeed, my tax plan that I've introduced, it's available on our website. It's a simple flat tax for everyone. It'll produce enormous economic growth, and it eliminates every mandate, every subsidy. So there's no subsidies for oil and gas, no subsidies for anyone. Now, it is true that there are a bunch of lobbyists and a bunch of Democrats in this state spending millions of dollars trying to convince the people of Iowa that I somehow oppose ethanol. It's not true. I have introduced legislation that would phase out the ethanol mandate over five years, but that is in the context of having no mandates whatsoever for anyone. And I would note there's a much more important government regulation to ethanol, and that's the EPA's blend wall that makes it illegal to sell mid-level blends of ethanol and gasoline. I will tear down the EPA's blend wall, which will enable ethanol to expand its market share by up to 60 percent, all without mandates, all without any government mandates whatsoever through the marketplace. And I'll note finally, Chris, there is a reason that Iowa's Congressman Steve King, perhaps the fiercest defender of farmers in this state, is chairing my campaign because he understands that I'm committed to a fair and level playing field for every energy source without lobbyists and without Washington picking winners and losers. Dr. Carson, I'd like to ask you about exactly that issue. Where are you on the mandatory ethanol standard? And precisely this question, should government be in the business of picking winners and losers, or should it be left to the marketplace? Well, uh, as anyone knows who's been listening to me, you know, I'm very much against the government being involved in every aspect of our lives. You know, we, <clears throat> last year... Last year, there were an additional 81,000 pages of government regulations. If you stack that up, it would be a three-story building. This is absolutely absurd. And they've insinuated themselves into everything. Now, as far as the renewable fuel standard is concerned, certain promises were made. Certain government uh, contracts were issued, which extend all the way into the year 2022. 
and I believe that it's probably unfair to withdraw the rug because people have invested money, people have invested a lot of energy into that. But you know, we are blessed with tremendous energy in this nation, and we need to be talking about new sources of energy. Seventy percent of our population lives bicoastally. Uh, what about hydroelectric power? We can develop that. You know, we have so much uh, natural gas now, and we can liquefy it. We can transfer it across the seas. We can make Europe dependent on us instead of Putin, put him back in his little box where he belongs. Those are the kinds of things that we ought to be doing. And, you know, take advantage of the tremendous opportunities and energy that God has given us, not get involved in these little petty arguments. Uh, and we can get a lot of them out if we get the government out of our lives. Doctor, thank you. Coming up, closing statements from the candidates as our debate continues live from Des Moines, Iowa. For closing statements, the candidates each get 30 seconds, and we begin with Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an eye surgeon from Bowling Green, Kentucky. I miss doing eye surgery, still get to do a little bit. Did a couple of cataract surgeries over Christmas holidays, got to go to Haiti last year. I've gotten to do some incredible things, got to be on the floor of the Senate. It's just been amazing to me. But the thing that is most important to me and caused me to run for office is I'm worried about the country and how much debt we're adding. <laughs> and I am the one true fiscal conservative who will look at all spending, and that's the only way we'll ever balance our budget. 
Thank you. Ohio Governor Kasich. You know, one of our biggest national security issues is the world looks at us sometime and we look at each other and say, why can't we solve problems? Well, I've got news for you, we can. We can, in fact, uh, create jobs and provide job security. We can create a situation where wages begin to rise. We can create a situation for our children to be able to get a decent job to pay down their college debt. We can reassume our role in the world, but all this has to come together when we have a positive attitude, an optimistic approach, an ability for us to set the tune as conservatives, but to invite other people in to be part of that orchestra. You see, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, I'm an optimist because I've seen so many things get accomplished in my lifetime, and we can do it again together, all of us, to strengthen this country, Thank work you. together. Thank you. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. On September 11th, my wife was two blocks from the World Trade Center. When those buildings came down, she was trapped in her building, and I didn't hear from her for over six hours. We had three children, eight, five, and one, and I had to confront the possibility of being a single parent. Terrorism in this country scares everyone. And the fact is we need a commander in chief who not only understands how to protect us, but feels in here what it means to face the possibility of loss. I've faced it. I've prosecuted terrorists. I have made the decisions that need to be made as a governor to protect us. And as president of the United States, no one will keep this country safer than I will. Thank you, Governor. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. Governor? We desperately need a conservative leader as President of the United States. I have a proven record as Governor of the State of Florida as a conservative leader. And I also had detailed plans to fix the mess in Washington, D.C. As President, I will restore and rebuild our military, restore the alliances, and keep us safe. And as our party's nominee, I will defeat Hillary Clinton in November. I ask for your support on the caucuses come Monday night, and I will make you proud as our party's nominee. Thank you very much. Dr. Ben Carson. I want to thank the people of uh, Iowa for being so welcoming to me. Please think of our founding fathers as you listen. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the benefits of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Folks, it's not too late. Enough said. Florida Senator Marco Rubio. The Bible commands us to let our light shine on the world. For over 200 years, America's light's been shining on the world, and the world has never been the same again. But now that light is dimming a little after seven years of Barack Obama. And that's why Monday night, what will happen here in Iowa is so important. I'm asking you for your vote. Caucus for me on Monday night, because if I'm your nominee, I will unite this party and I will defeat Hillary Clinton. And when I'm president, America's light will shine again and the 21st century will be a new American century. Thank you, Senator. Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Senator. 93 hours. The media noise will soon be over and it's now for the men and women of Iowa to decide. Our country's in crisis. We're worried the future of our children and we've been burned over and over again. The central question in this race is trust. Who do you know will kill the terrorists, defend the Constitution, and repeal Obamacare? Who do you know will stop amnesty and secure the borders? Who do you know will, will defend life, marriage, and religious liberty? Examine our records, pray on it, and I would be honored if you and your family would come caucus for us on Monday night. so much for being here tonight. We appreciate it greatly. And that does it for the seventh Republican primary debate of the 2016 presidential race. But we're not done. The <laughs> Kelly file starts in a moment. And guess who's going to be there? Senator Ted Cruz. And don't forget, after all the talk, the first voting of the 2016 campaign happens in just four days. The first Americans to vote. The Iowa caucuses are Monday, and Fox News will have complete coverage. And we have you covered from Iowa all the way to the conventions and on to the general election. Thanks again for joining us. For all of us here in Des Moines, have a great evening.